Okay, so oh, that's getting better. Thank you. Right. So now we're going to start, and then finally Richard is going to be talking about the IEA Regulatory Assistance Project, which actually looked at, in four continents around the world, the best practices in energy efficiency obligations. If you've got them, how to make sure they deliver as much as is realistically possible. So that's the three speakers we've got, but we want to devote a lot of time to your questions and answers at the end of the three talks. But we're going to start with Niels Bogg, and I'm lucky because he doesn't need any introduction. You all knew who he, who he is, and he's been actively involved in the Energy Efficiency Watch project, and he's going to tell us all about it. Thank you, Niels. Thank you, Ian. Uh, well, I don't know how many of you who know the Energy Efficiency Watch project. It's, a, it's an IE-funded project together with uh, your it's, it's uh, coordinated by Euphorus, which is uh, a renewable, originally a renewables organization in Brussels that works with parliamentarians around Europe, including the MEPs. Uh, there's ECOFIS, Wuppertal Institute, the uh, Upper Austria Energy Agency, ECEEE, Energy Cities, and FEDRN are working together in this project. And then we have uh, industry par um, partners that, that we consult with, but they're not part of the project. And uh, We've been doing this, it's the second round of this project, and it was started, yeah, it's come. It was started as a, as a way to keep, to facilitate implementation of the Energy Services Directive. Our first round of the, of the Energy Efficiency Watch looked at the first NEEPs that came in and evaluated them, and, and it was a bit of a row with, a, with, a, with, a, with the desk officers in the commission about were we doing an evaluation of the NEEPs or were we just doing a screening or what were we doing but it came up that we actually did a um, we did a screening the second time because the com commission was uh, evaluating them down at JRC anyway so maybe it's a matter of words and part of, of this product is to be a kind of reality check what is actually happening out on the ground out in the member countries as opposed to what the NEEPs are saying because that you know, it may not actually be a true reflection of reality, what's, what's in a NEEP. It's a plan, and, and this is more how a number of experts looked upon, upon this. So, so the product is, has been looking both into the NEEPs, and uh, we have done, it's Wuppertal and Ecofis have done a, a screening of, these of the 27 NEEPs, and they're all then as a country report for each, each of the member states together also taking in uh, from the survey. Um, and uh, an, an important thing of the product is to disseminate the, the results which we are doing right now. So I will focus on the survey and not the screening and not the reports because the screening looked more into the NEEPs, but the survey has some very interesting um, kind of things to take out, especially when we deal with, with energy efficiency obligation and the energy, energy efficiency directive. So. For you who were here two years ago may remember that we launched an online survey that we had been going all through 2011 and early 2012. And we had about, well, more than 700 respondents to that one. And what we have been looking into is actually the, the progress of energy efficiency, how experts around member states look upon that since the first NEEPs. So they don't say much about what's happened the last two years, so, so it's what happened up till about 2011. So one of the first questions we asked was, or the outcome is, how do you, ra how do you rank the progress in energy efficiency policies in your country over the last three years? So that's a general apprehension of, of, of all the experts. And of course, uh, this is not uh, status quo. It's not if it's good or bad now. It is actually what has happened in over the last three years. So some of the countries come out, you know, uh, has shown a lot of progress, like Finland and, and France. We're using the green and red, like, like energy label scale. And uh, you may think that Denmark has actually a better, uh, is actually better off. But of course, since Denmark was doing quite well before, it's here, then 
there wasn't so much progress because it was already quite good in many of our experts' views. So that's how it must be understood. It's not, it's not an assumption of if it's good today or not. It, it is, has it changed to the better or to the worse? Another question was, uh, no, we should skip that one. Uh, this uh, EU27 is the average degree of improvement looked upon different policies, is what you can make out of this report. Uh, and uh, in general, people think there has been a lot of improvement for all these things, uh, especially availability of energy efficiency information. Oh, here. And then. It looks upon the effectiveness of policy instruments. And now we're coming closer to the, to the purpose of today's session. And one thing we can, we can discuss, and we have discussed a lot, if we should ask for white certificates and energy efficiency obligation as different things, you should remember that when we started designing the survey, uh, it wasn't even sure that there was kind of an official term, the energy efficiency obligation. It was a kind of... Uh, it was a concept, it was, it was a generic term, but now it's really something that's also used in, in officially as something. So, so um, it's partly a matter of semantics, because white certificate is a more kind of precise and, and more specific terms of measure, which will go in under. So one, one can question if that was a good way to ask the questions or not, but they have been asked that way, and that's what the result we got. Um, but the obligations for energy companies come out pretty good, the uh, the uh, white certificates, actually people don't know very much about them. That's what the gray area indicates. People are kind of, well, have no idea, don't know what it is. And uh, we op we wanted to ask for energy efficiency funds come out quite well, and energy audits is the thing that comes out the best. Sorry, white certificates does not come out well, as you see, but, but uh, the obligations yeah, maybe a good thing, what people thought around Europe, that's that the aggregated view. And uh, smart metering, maybe yes also. Then if you go to look into, oh no. Yeah, and then, then there was also, we tried to ask what the expert thought, if we'd had really ambitious energy efficiency policies, what would the impact be? And the first, the top circle is about competitiveness if it would be, and 67% of, of experts around Europe think it will. And uh, a few think it's actually a more of a financial burden to EU industry than a competitive advantage. And some say, well, depends on uh, neither nor. 75% thinks they do create job, energy efficiency policies, and uh, actually 91% of all the respondents think they do stimulate innovation in business which is an important thing, and I think most people here would subscribe to that. So, but it, it confirms what, what uh, we believe in, and, and, and again, it's, it's, it's a pretty broad sample of experts. Just for you to know what the sectors, it's, it's a very good uh, distribution over all the sectors. It's business, universities, public, energy agencies, and others. So it's, it's not a very biased, uh, and that's, that's good. So. I will get, show you four slides before I, I let over, and that is, I will take four countries and to see, I have chosen two with some sort of, of obligation or white certificate type, and I've t taken two that do not apply this and see what people thought about the, uh, the effectiveness of different policy instruments for their own country. So uh, if you look at Denmark, white certificates is not seen as very effective. But Denmark already had a, a system for obligations, and basically everyone, 100%, thought it was an effective system. There was no one of the experts around that questioning them. I'm sure we could find people who are against it, but, but that was a very clear thing. Everybody was in favor of that. And voluntary agreements, yeah, pretty good. Smart metering, interesting, but no one, it, it doesn't come up to green. And uh, quali qualification, accreditation, certification s schemes is, are pretty good as well. Germany, well, did we miss one here? Yeah, no, it's some delay. So uh, France, which I would say at that time had something which is kind of a white certificate scheme. Very few people knew about it. I mean, having it in your own country and, and, and experts, but 40% of experts did not know about, you know, had no opinion or didn't, didn't know. And actually more people thought obligations would be efficient than white certificates. 
voluntary agreements, etc. Also, also. But for these two, you can see for France, it's it's generally reasonably positive, but nothing close to what what the, what people think about the Danish system, about their own system in Denmark. In Germany, you can see that white certificates has a very low rating, and also, of course, it's it's again people did not really know much about it, and obligations is also a bit hesitant. You know, it's it's. Uh, partly effective, but there's no kind of hallelujah for obligations in Germany when we ask our experts here. And these are, a lot of them are energy efficiency experts, so that's, that should also be, be, be known. It's not just uh, a, a kind of a statistical sample of, of decision makers surrounding the economy. Sweden is also a country which has been vehemently opposed to anything looking like energy efficiency obligations, and as you can see, even though we have a, a green certificate trading scheme in, in Sweden for renewables, white certificate does not fly there. And obligations is actually slightly pretty decent, but again, these are, the, these are people that, that are interested in, in getting energy efficiency policies working, mostly, so therefore it, it gets. So from this report, you can find it's, it's a 150-page report. I think you will find it interesting, unless you have, haven't started looking at it already, because it has a really interesting country snapshots, country by country, for a lot of policies. In addition to this, we did uh, almost 100 in-depth interviews with experts. So we, we picked for each country one person from the government sector, one person from academia, and one person from business. It some, sometimes it didn't work out, but, but that's basically what we did. So we, we tried to get additional input, which was used in the survey report as well as in, in the uh, national reports that, that Wuppertal and ECOFIS did. So, if you want to read more, oh, sorry, that, yeah, sorry, I forgot this one. The achievement of the national energy savings target, and if people think they're on track or not. And uh, in Denmark, very high. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a big difference from everyone else, but as you can see, there is more red and orange than there is green, how experts looked upon this some years ago. Then. So, it's, it's an interesting picture, and, and I, I think that was we have uh, got very interesting feedback from the report. A lot of people have thought it was interesting to see exactly what that we that we had people assessing their own countries, and that was very interesting, and, and also interesting for policymakers and, and national governments. So, if you want more information, this report and and the national country reports are on the Energy Efficiency Watch website, which you will find there. So, with this. I will hand over to Ian, and I hope you will go and find the report and you think it's interesting. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. And final speaker is Richard Cowart. Richard was an energy regulator for Vermont in the northeast of the US, and he was an early promoter of energy efficiency obligations. He's continued to support those in a, a, a series of guises. It's extended to also renewables, and more recently, it's about how can we get energy efficiency to play more of a part in energy market reforms that are going on around the world. But today, he's going to talk about a study that RAP and the IEA did. So please welcome Richard Cowart. All right. Um, it's sort of humbling to be here. I have to say, I know in this audience there are people who know more about everything I may mention than I know about it. And I will appreciate the opportunity to uh, answer questions and, and uh, speak about all of these topics. Um, it's also terrifically uh, fun to talk about the progress being made in, uh, in Europe with, under the Energy Efficiency Directive and the progress that I think will be made on, uh, as a result of the directive. Some of you know about RAP. We are a global nonprofit, a team of experts that really focuses on assisting governments in uh, addressing energy and environmental issues. We operate in China, in India, in the US, and in Europe. In Europe, we have offices in Brussels and in Berlin with a, a terrific team of people, a growing team of people operating uh, it, in Europe. I'm really thrilled to be here. So uh, it's pretty easy to, at this conference to boil, boil down some of these points. 
Um, energy efficiency first really should be our approach to resolving a number of the energy problems we have going forward. And I would say, as we think about where we're headed for 2030, energy efficiency first, done in a complementary way with our other energy goals, uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, really important. White certificates or energy efficiency obligations are powerful tools. They've been in practice in many jurisdictions for decades now. And I'm going to sort of pass on some of that experience from a study that we did with the uh, IEA. And I'm going to focus on some of the lessons learned that we have drawn and many other people have drawn from that experience. Um, let me just hold up the document. Uh, this, this is the report. It's very weighty, actually. We, put, we unfortunately printed it on heavy paper. Um, and, but the uh, content is actually pretty darn good. Um, and I've read a lot of such reports. We have, a, we have the slimmed down executive summary version that, that gives you the scoops on all of these uh, 19 different um, energy efficiency obligation schemes that we studied. And we studied them and in a systematic way across more than a dozen uh, consistent criteria. Uh, so we'd be happy for you to pick those up uh, as you, uh, you know, leave this room. Whether called um, efficiency obligations, sometimes in the US they were called efficiency resource standards. Um, you know, what are the key elements of an energy efficiency uh, obligation? Um, obviously, it begins with a public mandate to require an energy provider to prove that activities have resulted in energy efficiency improvements in eligible end use customers. It sounds very much like what we just heard uh, from Claudia about that. Um, in, in some systems, of course, installers or delivery agents can earn white certificates and in Every, in, in a few jurisdictions around the world, those certificates are tradable. But traded, tradable certificates is not the dominant approach uh, in most of the world. Let me just start with this question about why we even obligate energy companies. Because oftentimes we're asked you know, that particular question. And it, it varies from place to place why that is the case. Uh, originally in the US, where integrated resource planning was developed and practiced pretty widely, um, the, the whole idea was that we, when you think about the electric system, historically, people would think of generation, transmission, and distribution. They take load as sort of the thing at the end of the wire that we're just stuck with. Demand-side management, or integrated resource planning, took the view that load is actually part of the system. And that if you can intelligently manage load, you can reduce costs and improve system operation. That became such an uh, sort of, well, we heard Amory Lovins the other night talking uh, essentially about that. Um, it became such a, a powerful idea that it became practiced in many places. A second argument often given is that it is energy providers who have the customer relationship. And the third argument, and something that I focus on, because I, as a former government official, I try to be really practical about this, is that frequently you can fund the program with non-government revenues, uh, something which I always recommend. OK, a global experience. What, did we, what have we seen around the globe with respect to these obligations? As no one here needs me to tell you about the European experience, uh, so I can pass quickly on that. I think this list is going to be a growing list. A lot of Europeans are unaware that there are 24 American states that have, for some time now, had uh, energy efficiency resource standards in place. And there are decades and decades of experience with those uh, programs. Um, in Australia, the three largest states have them. In China, they, there's a big program now of energy efficiency um, implemented in part through utilities. Other jurisdictions around the world, including Brazil, Korea, and some of the Canadian provinces have them as well. So here's a map of the US that gives you an idea of how widely um, spread the energy efficiency obligations are uh, you know, across the states. 
the, altogether, the states that are covered by energy efficiency obligations account for, now I'd say, more than half of the load uh, or the final sales in the United States. It's about half? Yeah. Yeah. One interesting point that, you know, it's really not well known even in, in except in e efficiency circles in the U.S., is how spending on these programs has grown. I think that you know, many of us think of politics in the U.S. as being so uh, slow to get with it when it comes to the, the future of the planet. But in, the, in this particular arena, this is a little bit of evidence to me that even in a place where the politics are pretty tough, the commitment by legislatures, regulators, utilities, and others to the idea of investing in energy efficiency has been strong and growing. We now uh, find that there is something like seven billion U.S. dollars a year spent on energy efficiency obligations in the U.S. In China, there has really been a revolution in thinking on this topic. Um, our, po our colleagues in China have been working on this along with a lot of other people, of course. In the current uh, five-year plan, there is a very you know, high-level, top-down commitment in, from the Chinese government for a 16% reduction in energy intensity and a 17% reduction in carbon intensity. And along with that, they expect they're going to get something that Chinese people just on the street would really like to have, which is an improvement in uh, conventional pollutants as well. These are mandatory obligations that are passed down through the Chinese system from national to regional to uh, provincial to uh, local governments. And I th they're approaching this through a variety of mechanisms. They don't just have one tool. It isn't just one thing. The, the demand-side management rule, the new uh, 2011 demand-side management rule, begins by requiring distribution utilities to spend a really small number at this point, but it's expected to grow uh, three tenths of a percent of total revenues. Uh, uh, t I'm sorry, to deliver incremental savings of a third of a percent annually, and a lot of the funding for efficiency comes, in fact, from the government. And the uh, total spending, and you're, I'm going to come back to this number a few times. Total spending in China now on programmatic energy efficiency is roughly 3% to 4% of total power system revenues. So that number, 3%, 4%, is a number to keep in mind. So what lessons do we learn? What lessons have many people learned from this global experience? The first, the, the, the first point is to design these programs recognizing the many benefits of uh, energy efficiency. This particular chart is something that at RAP we call the uh, layer cake. Um, and we turned it into a pie chart recently, so we could have both cake and pie. But the, the, the point here is to recognize that energy efficiency at customer locations is delivering multiple benefits to a power system. And that frequently, when we do the cost-benefit analysis or we do the political you know, debating on this point, we tend to overlook a number of these benefits. Um, you know, including things like avoided line losses, uh, avoiding distribution capacity upgrades, and so forth. And, um, and in addition, of course, as many people in this room know, there are non-energy benefits like improvements in health that go along with investments in efficiency. So the first thing is design the EEO or the White Certificates Program or the alternative program so that it embraces those benefits and tries to um, tap those values to, f to pay for them. No surprise here, you know that energy efficiency obligations are cost effective, and people are sometimes surprised to hear how many, how many studies there have been that looking hard at the question, are we really getting significant savings from our programs, and, and what, are they, what are they worth? What, so just as a ballpark figure, uh, even after these programs have been running for a couple of decades, 
we're saving electricity in the U.S. for roughly three to four cents a kilowatt hour saved. Um, in the EU, Ian Lease has n a variety of really good numbers on this, that uh, you can save gas for 25% of the cost of gas to the final consumer. And of course, you're saving on all of these other uh, upstream benefits in the, in the pipes, in the wires, and the generation. There's also something that is now, I think, starting to be understood a lot more. In liberalized electricity markets, where the clearing price in the power market is set by the last unit running, energy efficiency has the effect of lowering the bid stack. And when you lower the bid stack, you're actually lowering the clearing price for every consumer who's taking a power in that market. And it turns out that when you actually examine what's going on, uh, often enough, the merit order effect alone, lowering costs for everybody, is adequate to pay for the entire program. And that's discounting all of the other, you know, it's without even looking at all of the other benefits that come from this. This is a, a good point to keep in mind when, where as we are concerned about the impact of efficiency programs on general consumers who may be non-participants in the, in the program itself. Third lesson is that energy savings grow over time. And this is now, I'm looking at the chart that we just saw from the commission about the, the notion that over time these savings were going to stack up towards 2020. And uh, this is a historic chart from Lawrence Berkeley Lab about the California experience in the, in the late, uh, from, well, from 1975 to 2000. And there really are two, th I put this picture in for two reasons, because it shows that over time, if you keep the programs going, they add more and more and more in terms of avoided load and avoided costs on the power system. At the end of this period, you know, you're looking at 10,000 megawatts of load avoided by a combination of efficiency measures. 10,000 megawatts in California at that point is 25% of total load. And the so as at that point in time, energy efficiency was actually the largest single source of power on the, on the California electric grid. And the next point, look at the combination of programs that stack up to reach that goal. It's not just the utility EEO. It's not just building codes. It's not just appliance standards. It's all of them. Another example of how the values of energy efficiency have been recognized now, in this case, in a competitive market. Less well-known example. Here's a, this is a story about a debate that happened in North America, very similar to debates unfolding right now in Europe, about the need for capacity markets in, the power, in liberalized power systems. Propo there were proposals to create capacity markets in North America, and there are capacity markets in a lot of those liberalized markets now. Energy efficiency advocates came forward and said, well, if you need capacity, why not recognize the capacity benefits of efficiency and demand response? And if you're going to have a capacity market, allow those demand side resources to bid head to head against supply. At first, the system operators had a hard time believing that this could really you know, be true. You know, could we really rely on efficiency and demand response in the same way we rely on power plants? And after some consideration, they agreed to experiment uh, in doing it. And the, um, the experience starting in, in New England in 2007, uh, energy efficiency and demand side resources won two thirds of the, f of the bids in the first opening market. They substantially lowered the clearing price. And in the PJM auc auction, which is the biggest wholesale power market in North America, and maybe except for China, it's the biggest in the world, uh, in, in their first auction, the demand side management bids were so successful in lowering the clearing price that I think they saved customers more than a billion dollars um, just by showing up and and diminishing the amount of money that had to be paid for generation side uh, capacity. Next lesson, 
we have to design programs so they work for customers. And so if you look at the successful programs around the world, and this is, again, I should go quickly here because you all know this. The market barriers you know, don't go away. And they remain in liberalized markets, in vertically integrated markets, in mixed markets. Uh, market barriers are still there. And if you want your program to work, it's got to work for customers. And here it's a bit of a conf confession for me because as a regulator, I used to think that it was, I, I, I naturally tried to organize program design so that it worked for the utilities and the government. And it was only after doing it for a while that I realized that it, they weren't going to work at all unless they actually worked for customers. So I'm just going to skip through that. Who should be obligated? Uh, we are often asked this question, should it be the distribution company, should it be the retailers, should it be the government? And if you look around the world, the best programs, there is no single answer to this. It depends entirely on the local circumstances. Some of the some really good programs, uh, the obligation is on the regulated distribution company, like in California um, or in Italy, in, or it could be on competitive retail suppliers, as in Australia, and so forth. There are a lot of different options. How big should, the, should our targets be? A uh, big debate at the time of the EED, how big should it be? Uh, our evidence is that strong programs can consistently add 2% savings incremental per year, year after year after year. In uh, New South Wales, the goal is um, savings growing to 34% total over 11 years. New, New York, which is a pretty big environment, is saving 2% a year. Um, the same is true of a number of U.S. states. Oh, and the, this last point here, maybe it won't go back. There we go. Leading programs, when you look at how much they're spending, 3% to 5% of total system revenues turns out to be a pretty good number to run a successful program capturing 2% inc incremental savings a year. The next point on this is a political point. If you look around, uh, in this case, the United States, at jurisdictions that have had fairly aggressive programs, and you say, well, you had aggressive programs. What, what political lessons came from that? And here you have a list of who were the leading programs in 2006 or 2009, either one, and then ask where are those programs today? And what you see is that the most aggressive programs, the folks that were doing the most, are, are now doing even more. And the reason is that those who were doing a lot have now shown the public that the program works. Quality control, uh, monitoring and verification, and continuous improvement. All right. Um, we had a lot of discussion on this earlier today, and I can go pretty quickly here, um, are totally essential to successful uh, programs over the long term. And now one of my favorite topics, stable and adequate funding. We saw some presentations yesterday about what's happening with, um, I'll just take the UK right now, that the UK is not unique in having a uh, situ situations like this. Um, first of all, you need adequate funding. Secondly, it needs to be stable. And the, the industries that depend on these programs to actually go out and deliver services cannot be turned off and turned on um, like you know, a water spigot, as Ian says. The, the funding needs to be both adequate and stable. And so what this means is that we really have to work hard to come up with the mechanisms uh, to make sure that, that these, if you're going to have an efficiency obligation, you have to figure out a, uh, an adequate way to finance it. And the industry has to believe that the money is going to be there for the long term in order for them to build a business. Uh, this is just a chart showing some history in California where they went through various uh, political changes and the and the funding went up and down and it was it became incredibly difficult for uh, industry to respond to that
I'm going to close by talking about the one source of revenue, which I believe is, r is a pr very promising one, um, and particularly in Europe, and that is the use of carbon revenues to pay for energy efficiency programs. Uh, there's just such a natural connection between knowing, on the one hand, that energy efficiency is the lowest cost way uh, in large scale to reduce emissions, and having a revenue source at hand from the sale of carbon allowances that could fund that low-cost solution. That I can't help myself, but I have to, you know, bring this topic up whenever I have the chance. Um, I was in a, a session yesterday where uh, Louise Sunderland was was talking about the same topic. Um, in, and this slide shows uh, some calculations done by Ian Lease, but we've done similar studies in other jurisdictions, and the, and the outcome is pretty much always the same. If you are relying on high energy prices to, to drive down demand, you need a huge price increase to make a big difference in carbon terms. That's politically unacceptable and undesirable price increase. And because the price elasticity of demand for electricity is so low, uh, as shown here in the blue wedge, a rate increase gets you a pretty small reduction in consumption. On the other hand, the same amount of money from whatever source, but in this case I'm saying why not carbon revenue, uh, the same amount of money invested in an efficiency program in uh, the UK, for example, based on historic data, would yield nine times more savings um, in carbon terms and to the power sector and to customers. Now, carbon markets could be used for this purpose. It's a goal stated, uh, as you know, in the European uh, legislation to do so. And, the, and there are jurisdictions in Europe uh, now that are either doing it or planning to do it. Uh, I want to just leave you, this will be my last point, with the story from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the U.S. Ten states in the northeastern part of the U.S. have a cap-and-trade program for power sector carbon emissions. And they decided, and this was something that had to be decided individually by all ten states, to dedicate most of the revenue to energy efficiency. And they have dedicated roughly 60% of the revenue to uh, investments in end-use energy efficiency for the past few years. And as a result of that, they turned around and, and they've done a number of analyses now on this, and they figured out, like, well, what happened? So carbon prices in Reggie are very low, maybe $3 US dollars a ton. And people would say, well, for $3 a ton, a carbon price isn't going to get you very much, which is true. $3 a ton devoted to energy efficiency, however, allowed the program to exceed its goals, reduce emissions uh, more than uh, the, the target, and, um, and to save consumers a great deal of money. And it has been calculated in a variety of ways that the cost per ton avoided under this program was minus $73 a ton you look at it from the point of view of consumers, they actually saved money under this program. And obviously the macroeconomic effects were very strong. As a result, just this year when this program was up for renewal, we saw that the governors of the Reggie states were I embracing the program, calling for a tighter cap, and saying, we like this program because it's funding investments in clean energy resources in our states, and it's reducing uh, the cost of energy. So it's a, there's a story in here about connecting an efficiency objective to a carbon uh, mandate and a carbon objective in a very positive way that can help achieve the goals of both. With that, I'll leave you. Thank you very much. Right, so please try and keep your questions fairly short and your comments even shorter, <laughs> and then we'll get as much as going. Jim, Jim Ski over there. He's from Sustainable Energy Authority, Ireland. Thanks very much for the presentations. It's a question for Richard, really about clarification on the um, 
uh, stable and adequate funding uh, part of the presentation. And I think you had 30% um, or so, 30, 35% government funding, or public funding rather, and the rest. Uh, in Ireland, we're trying to shift away from, from a grant scheme which, um, which, which funds uh, insulation works at about that ratio already. Uh, and I think the hope is that an obligation scheme would cost the government a lot less than that uh, grant scheme. So I'm just clarifying you saying there still needs to be 30% towards, for example, the cost of measures associated with an obligation scheme, or have I misinterpreted? I'm still saying that you, it, uh, based on the program designs that we've seen that are effective, that are achieving something in the range of one and a half or two percent a, a year in savings, you will need um, something in the range of 20 to 30 percent of the funding to come from some socialized source. Now, if you have an obligation, a typical obligation scheme, that source is the obligated party. So it's energy providers or distribution companies are rolling it into their, their cost of business. It doesn't have to be government money. But uh, you know, the, the positive side of this that I'd like to emphasize is that as a general matter for you know, every euro or dollar or what have you that gets spent on that side, the, you're leveraging three or four units of it, private investment and the economic, the macroeconomic modeling always shows that the returns to the treasury and the returns to the economy are even a multiple of that. So yeah, one way or another that th the expectation that it will just happen in the market has been proven by the fact that it doesn't happen in the market. Hope that helps in your continuing arguments. <laughs> yes, Erica at the back please. Hello, I'm Erica Hope from the European Climate Foundation. Um, your figure about getting nine times as much CO2 savings from investing money, this is to Richard, investing money into efficiency programs rather than uh, raising rates. Which kind of efficiency programs were you talking about there? And also, which kind of efficiency programs is the money used for in Reg -E? And if I can add a, throw a third question in, how is that kind of organized? Does Reggie have a fund that then uh, other people approach, or could you just say a few words about the governance of that? Thank you. You answer the first part. Okay. The first part was based on the energy efficiency obligation, the actual energy or electricity saving measures that were installed between 2005 and 2008. And it was then assumed that that sort of energy saving measures would be carried forward. And that was how the numbers were arrived. And they were all corrected for the many, many things you need to do for comfort factors, heat replacement effect, all et cetera. So they are quite rigorously uh, conservative estimates. And to answer your question about the Reggie states, there are, uh, well, 10 different or nine different, depending on which year, Reggie states. And each, these are, the, the revenue is received individually in those states. So there's no single Reggie pool of funds. And so just as in the European Union, the revenues would go to member states and member states would make their own decisions. How they're administered in each individual state varies. And it would be sort of a long conversation, but it's, al it's along the lines of comprehensive energy efficiency programs, residential retrofits, commercial lighting, industrial motors, the usual a fairly broad array of end-use uh, applications. Thank you. Richard. I'll just chime in on that. I, it's quite common in the uh, U.S. states that have energy efficiency obligations that there are specifically, uh, you could say, ring-fenced or targeted goals for uh, treating low-income households and making sure that they are um, addressed quite explicitly, in some cases quite aggressively, under those programs. So it's not at, at all rare. Okay. Alexandre from GDF Suez. It's, it's a question to Richard. You, you made a very comprehensive comparison of different obligation system in the world. You presented that. And you were saying they were successful in showing some data how much energy they saved. But um, I. Uh, my question is that, for me, an energy 
saving obligation system is very efficient when it brings real savings and savings that did not happen if there would not have been this energy savings obligation. So you need to take out the free riders and you need to check in reality what really happens because some of the system are based on dim saving. I can speak for France, for example. So, so how reliable is this result that they are successful? Uh, that's really a terrific question. It was the subject of a lot of discussion in other rooms in, in, at this session. And the, the perfectly correct answer to your question is it varies a lot from place to place. Quite a number of the jurisdictions that you know, are mentioned in our report have very well developed monitoring, verification, and evaluation schemes that go with them that take out the free riders, that adjust for the degradation of savings over time, you know, that, l that follow up with studies to see in, uh, to check the claims with a random sample of installations, are they really working, that kind of thing. And so there is a huge body of experience, and in fact a whole professional association of monitoring and verification pros who get together and exchange information about how to do this well. So I, I don't want to overclaim here, but I, I am confident that in the well-run programs that I've cited to you here, the savings claims are pretty sound. And, and I can also speak personally because I was a regulator responsible for paying for programs for a dozen years and part of the National Committee of Regulators that, that did this in the United States. And we, of course, were very concerned about wasting the customer's money and also not delivering savings that we knew would be quite valuable. And so we were constantly pushing for better monitoring and evaluation. And uh, when utilities did not perform well, uh, they were they were uh, penalized financially. So there, re there became a pretty good practice for this. And so I'll just stop and say, I feel pretty good about these numbers. I know there are places where the free ridership is very high. You mentioned, uh, I assume you're thinking about boilers in France maybe. You know, there, there are programs where the numbers uh, probably wouldn't pass muster under some of the good m and protocols. I, I would just simply add to that. I think I agree with everything Richard said, but it's not only energy efficiency obligations that suffer from free riders and increased comfort, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think one of the great things about the energy efficiency directive is going to make all programs actually have to look very hard at what are the real energy savings. And I think I think it is fair to say historically, driven by people like Richard with concern for customers' money, they've actually probably led the way in a lot of this monitoring, verification, and evaluation of programs. So as long as it's a level playing field, we're confident, Richard, aren't we? So one question there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Petra Holub, Chance for Buildings. Uh, my question follows on the issue of the risk of uh, real implementation of EOs in each country and then risk of uh, having uh, shallow renovations when it comes to building. So what are the tools within various uh, EOs throughout the Europe or, or the US to avoid the risk of a shallow renovation? Because the uh, utilities, they are motivated, naturally motivated to do the cost-effective measures, but what we need to see also is to see deep renovation or stage deep renovation, but not the shallow renovation that would be locked in some of the potential on each individual buildings. It, it seems like there was a lot in that question, but I'm, I'll, I'll start with the, the last part about um, shallow actions versus much deeper actions. And, and you're asking what kind of measures can you institute at the beginning of an EEO to make sure that you don't just run out and capture the, e the easy stuff and that's it. That, I got it. So, um, it. That's a really tough challenge for the program uh, administrators. 
And it, it illustrates one of the very first points that I think needs to get made. And it, it deals also with your question about free riders and is the EM and V good and that kind of thing. Is you need a program administrator who has the, the, the staffing and the professional and technical capability and political sensitivity, I would add, to do a good job in instituting and supervising the program. And that's something that is often overlooked by governments. And they just think, well, you know, they look around and they think, which agency do we want to, you know, <laughs> to put this in? And the, they don't necessarily think through the question, well, which agency will have the staying power and the funding and the staff to do this well year after year? Because there's a learning curve inside the government for this. And so first is choose the right agency. Second, give them a proper mandate to actually institute or supervise the program. Sometimes in, in some jurisdictions around the world, that's the energy regulator. In other places, it's the energy ministry. In some places, it might be a special purpose agency created for just this purpose. But it needs to have adequate funding in order to do that job. That's the first thing. The second thing is in the portfolio of responsibilities given to the obliged party, there needs to be a, uh, an ability to go off and do some things that are relatively easy and also to get extra credit and support for doing the things like deep renovation that are quite hard. And there are a bunch of different ways to do that by making more money available, by requiring that a certain percentage of the installations or a certain percentage of the savings have to come from deep actions, or in a white certificates program giving extra credit for deep renovations. You can think of, of a bunch of different ways to do it. But you're asking a really good question, and the answer is both to think it through and think what the performance incentive is to do well at that, but also to be, to realize that you need a portfolio of actions that includes some relatively easy actions and some relatively hard actions. It's not, you don't want all cream skimming and you don't want all, it's deep retrofits or nothing. The annual savings may be a bit lower for an object, but the total lifetime savings may end up much bigger anyway. So is that the normal practice in programs around the world to look at the lifetime savings and then you have to, to attribute a long lifetime, obviously, to a deep renovation to then to a shallow measure? The, the, well, as you know, in Europe, sometimes it's first-year savings that's counted. So sometimes, you know, they don't, they don't count lifetime. But many jurisdictions and most of the jurisdictions in North America count lifetime savings. Although, to be fair, it's sensible to discount, you know, really long time future measures uh, or the future savings when you're calculating. And I, at this point, I'm going to look at Chris Nemi because he knows this very well. How would you answer that question? <clears throat> I, I guess I'd say two things. Um, wh one is that in North America, uh, actually most of the savings targets are actually articulated as first year savings. There are, there is this, there is a concern around that that is right. leading to shorter, that it's leading to too much shorter lived savings and there's a lot of jurisdictions that are relooking at this question. In the Canadian province of Ontario, about two years ago, they abandoned first year savings as their, as their focus and all of their targets now are expressed as lifetime savings. Um, but the other thing I would say with respect to the deep retrofit question is that all of the leading jurisdictions that I'm familiar with in North America, um, when you talk about an obligation in an obligated, uh, well, when you talk about an obligation, the, the first thing you think of is, well, how much energy savings do I need to produce? And they all have those targets, but every single one of them has multiple performance targets, and certain weight is assigned to each of those targets. The, the total amount of savings they generate tends to be the most important, the one with the greatest weight, but they often have additional um, uh, targets around uh, how many buildings that they get deep, deep retrofits on. Did they succeed in, in getting, increasing the market share for a particular product which has been having trouble uh, gaining traction? 
So it, it all comes down to what the regulators or whoever's in charge of overseeing the obligated entity, uh, what priorities they have in mind, um, and then making sure that they articulate those priorities in a comprehensive set of uh, goals and targets and obligations that they then impose on that entity rather than just a single target. Thanks, Le Louise Sunderland from the UK. Um, can I pick up on one of the last points that uh, Richard made, which was about the revenues from the carbon markets and uh, the need to kind of stabilize the income to make sure that our programs don't stop and start and, and obviously all the, the impacts that has on the supply chain. Aside from the UK carbon floor price, which is a mechanism that I don't I can't really see that m many other member states taking up at the moment. Are there any other innovative finance mechanisms that you've sort of come across in your travels that you think might be suitable for topping up to a stable level initial funding that could wiggle about all over the place? Well, but my first answer would be to say that you already have, we already have it. A, an, an ETS with revenues that we can look at. So, and, and the, um, and one v view that, that I would take of this, and, and we will be releasing a report on this um, based on some really comprehensive analysis done by the Energy Center of the Netherlands, uh, that shows that a, a d sort of a different approach that where the first three or five euros of carbon revenues, whatever the price may be, it may go up and down, but the first, let's just say, three, reve three euros per ton of carbon revenues, if they were devoted in a member state to an energy efficiency fund or an energy efficiency program of some kind, they would have the kind of benefits that I showed in that, in that slide from Reggie. I mean, the, the, the Reggie um, price per ton was two to three dollars. And yet there was enough revenue there to double efficiency spending in a region that already had pretty big programs and to produce really significant results. So that's one idea. Um, there are any number of you know, taxation ideas uh, in Europe, of course. There are a lot of energy taxes already in Europe that could, a piece could be carved out of those taxes and dedicated to energy efficiency. Everybody is looking for ways to take what would amount to the smallest fraction of public money to leverage the biggest fraction of private capital to achieve e efficiency investments. And so you, you have these um, you know, good models. You have the KFW model, for example, and that is attempting to, to um, through a variety of means, to leverage action um, quite significantly. I don't... That, the last thing I'll say is that when I look at the system revenues in the power sector or in the natural gas sector, there are huge flows of money. And I used to have the sense, as we ever discussed you know, energy efficiency finance, I used to have the sense that when you think about all the money that's actually in the energy scene, there's an ocean of money. And all that efficiency advocates are asking for is a bucket to just go, you know, just take some of it for the benefit of end use customers. And, it, and we keep looking around for wh who's got a bucket. Sorry, that's not a very good answer, but the, I am a fan of wires charges or pipes charges on the distribution of uh, gas and electric companies because they're steady, they're stable, they can be low, and they're regulated. So that's, so I don't know. I've just given you three places where I always look to see when I'm in a jurisdiction, hey, do you have this? Have you tried that? Thank you, Richard. I've actually just learned of something that's even better on offer in Europe than the KFW scheme, and that is in France, because you can now borrow money for energy, deep energy efficiency retrofits at 0%. Yeah, magic, because Didier said he's, Didier Bosboeuf, I'm sure you know from Adem, he did the sums. He was in the, for a minute, but he disappeared before I could get hold of him. Uh, <laughs> but he uh, looked at, there's two options. You can either have a tax break, but you have to find the money up front, and Hoover's is rich enough to have that, or 
you can have the 0% loan. So off he went. He, great. Uh, there was a, did you see another question somewhere? I'm going to use my chairman's prerogative in the interests of fairness to ask Niels a question. Niels, what next for Energy Efficiency Watch? Um, well, it ends in October. So we have a new application in, and we know there's a tremendous interest both from the Commission and the Parliament. So we hope it will be uh, approved again, because it's the last run of IE as it looks now. But we think it's, it's, it has been a really good project, especially the second round of it. So we do hope we will have it up and going in about April or so next year again. But I don't know. We hope. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Well, just before we finish, I would just once again like to say, Richard, thank you for bringing your vast experience and great insights into all the complexities in this area. Niels for updating us. And this is his 20th year at the summer study. And you think about it, he's still as useful and as energetic as when he first came. Well done. What an energy efficiency supporter. And Claudia, I really appreciate you coming and, and answering so many questions as helpfully and clearly, as of course there are some things you can't say, but by and large, I thought it was fantastic. So for all three speakers, please give them a great round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.